The Bronze Bow, Chapter 13 Daniel's chief doubt about the new meeting place, that it would take him from home for long hours at a time, resolved itself more simply than he expected. Leah listened to his explanation and seemed to grow accustomed to his absences, as she had once accepted the fact that her grandmother must work in the fields. Leah was gaining confidence. She did not tire as readily at the loom. She had even completed a length of cloth, which had been paid for by the servant of the widow of Corazon. When Daniel had laid the shining silver talent in his sister's hand, she had been bewildered. He realized that she had never before known any recompense for her hours at the loom. He showed her how to sew the coin into her headscarf, where every village girl, even the poorest, boasted the jingling coins that would be her dowry. Leah was as enchanted as a child. Now she always wore the headdress as she worked, and from time to time her hand stole up to touch the coin. Underneath the scarf the long yellow hair was always combed and carefully arranged. Was it the work in the little garden that had brought a faint flush to her pale cheeks? One afternoon, looking through the door of his shop, Daniel saw two figures coming slowly along the road in shimmering waves of heat. One, he soon saw, was Joel. The other, he was not sure of. A new recruit? The two figures were almost to his door before he recognized, with a shock of pleasure, that the one who had come with Joel was his sister, Malthus. She wore a yellow mantle with green embroidered girdle and a green and white striped headdress that showed just the edge of the dark sweep of her hair. I've never been in a blacksmith shop before, she exclaimed, sweeping back the headdress in the impressive gesture Daniel always remembered first when he thought of her. I've been begging Joel to let me come to see it. Embarrassed, Daniel wiped his sooty hands and brought a jar of water from the house, wishing he had more to offer. I'd like to ask you to come into my, into Simon's house, he began. It doesn't matter. It's lovely here in the shop, said Malthus quickly. The two visitors sat on the bench and watched him complete the lock that he had promised to deliver before sunset. I'm glad you came today, Daniel told Joel when the work was done. There's an apprentice I want you to meet over in the street of the weavers. I think he wants to join us, but he has some foolish ideas in his head that the rabbi has taught him. I can't talk him out of them, but you could. Go along and see him, Malthus suggested. I don't mind staying here alone. I'd rather start back when it's cooler. Are you sure? It would take only a short time. It took a considerably longer time than Daniel had reckoned because Joel and the young weaver lost themselves in the intricacy of a theological debate. It was nearing sunset when they started back toward the smithy. He's going to be one of the best we have, Joel said, but you should have stopped us. When I get started in an argument, I forget what time it is. He did not seem to want to hurry, however, and shortly it appeared that he had something else on his mind. I've put off telling you this, he said finally. I don't know just why. I saw your carpenter again. Was Simon with him? Yes, as a matter of fact, when I told you that day that I'd run into Simon, that wasn't altogether true. I went back to Bethsaida on purpose. I went back several times. Lately, I've been getting up early to hear Jesus when he talks to the fishermen. Daniel was surprised. You think he will help us? Joel hesitated. He has helped me. He has explained several points of the law that have always puzzled me. Explain them to you? You're the scholar. He's only a carpenter. I don't know where he got his training, Joel said, but he knows the scripture. Some of his ideas are the same as father's, only he seems to go beyond somehow. He has a way of making something very clear and uncomplicated so that you wonder why you never thought of it that way before. The first time I heard him, Daniel said, I thought that if only he and Rosh could join together. I've thought so too. So many people follow him. Some mornings there are more than a hundred. If anyone could persuade them, but then again, I'm not sure. I wish you'd come to listen to him, Daniel. Every time I hear him, I wish you were there. 
We both think, does Camille go with you? Joel laughed. <laughs> Not Camille. I persuaded him to go once. He was horrified. He's too much like his father. No, Thesha goes with me. She, oh my word, I forgot Thesha. She'll be furious at me. The girl was not in the smithy. As the two boys stood uncertainly in the doorway, a soft murmur of voices drifted through the inner door. Surely it could not be. Then Daniel heard the quick, light peal of Thesha's laughter. <laughs> Wait here, he told Joel. There was no one in the inner room. Beyond, in the small garden, two girls sat side by side on the bench. Oh, Daniel, Leah cried, catching sight of her brother. Thesha came to see me. Dumbfounded, Daniel stared from one to the other. Ah, uh, how, he stammered, and then caught the warning in Thesha's eyes. Don't spoil it, her look cautioned him quite plainly. He could think of nothing at all to say, could only stand stupidly. How had she managed it when no one... Not a neighbor or an old friend had been allowed to see Leah's face for almost ten years. We've been having a lovely visit, Thesha said as casually as though it happened every day. Leah's been showing me her vegetables. The time has gone fast. We've had so much to talk about. These two, so utterly different. What could you talk about, he burst out before he could stop himself. Mischief danced in Thesha's eyes. You, she said. He felt his ears redden. He knew he would never know how she had accomplished it. Girls were strange creatures. He could not understand them, but he could see the change in his sister's face. She was fragile and pale beside Thesha's vivid beauty, but smiling with a smile so like their mother that it caught at his throat. Joel, impatient and curious, came through the inner door. It was too much to hope that the miracle should include him, too. At the first glimpse of him, Leah's bright face grayed with fear. Thesha motioned him out of sight. My brother and I must go home, she said gently, but I will come back soon. You won't forget me, will you, Leah? There was no answer. Leah's head was bent. The folds of the scarf that hid her face were trembling. Here's something to remember me by, said Thesha. She undid the green embroidered girdle from her waist and laid it gently across Leah's knees. The gold threads twinkled in the afternoon sun. God be with you, she said quickly, and not waiting for an answer, moved past Daniel through the smithy, too quickly for him to stop her or to try to thank her. Daniel stood looking down at his sister. He saw one finger slowly move out from the veil and touch the girdle, tracing the scarlet and blue and purple threads as though they might vanish at too heavy a touch. It was the first beautiful thing she had ever owned. Thesha's visit caused Daniel to look at his sister with new eyes, and one thing that he had never noticed before suddenly shamed him. She had spent all day weaving fine cloth for a wealthy woman, and she herself was dressed in a faded gray rag. Next morning, he took down the jar in which he kept the money his customers gave him and counted out a handful of coins and made his way to the market. It was a confusing place, the kind a man did well to stay away from. The booths of the weavers were surrounded by women, chattering like a woods full of sparrows, fingering the links of scarlet and purple, bargaining with shark accusing screams. He gathered his courage and approached, trying to ignore their derisive glances. Presently, he found what he wanted, a length of smooth cotton, the clear, fresh blue of the Ketza blossoms. How much, he growled. A girl with gold earrings studied him shrewdly. Blue dye is rare, she said. Two shekels. He knew it was too much. He had no way of knowing how much too much, and he had no knack for bargaining anyway. He paid the money and cursed himself when she did not hide her contempt. Thread, he glared at her. 
She had found it for him. Do you have a needle too, she asked. The girl laughed. We don't sell needles. Surely you must have a wife with a needle. He said nothing, but the flush creeping up his cheeks made the girl laugh again. Oh, she said, a present, is it? Wait a minute. She delved beneath a pile of odd articles. Here, take one of mine. I won't charge you for it. The fine gesture he could see was an apology for the scandalous profit she had made on the cloth. He took the package and walked away, his ears red. Leah could not believe that the cloth was hers. Just to touch its smooth surface seemed to give her joy that Daniel did not dare to suggest that it had a useful purpose. He waited for two mornings before he brought up the needle and thread. Leah watched his clumsy experiments, fascinated. Suddenly a squeal of laughter broke from her, so startling that he dropped the needle. He had never heard her laugh before. The breathy little sound died away as quickly as it started. Oh, Daniel, you hold it like one of those great iron things. Give me that. Can you thread a needle? He asked, astonished. Anybody can thread a needle. Daniel, do you think, would you be angry with me if I made a dress out of the blue cloth? Through the door of the smithy, he watched Leah spread the cloth on the floor, marveling at the capable way she turned it this way and that as she cut. Praise be. Perhaps she could even make him a new cloak.